Gary Santos is a professor at Yale University. So he teaches the most popular course uh, on the university campus. Uh, I wish I had time to let you guess at what you think the course might be, but it is a class called Psych 157. It is psychology and the good life. She will have 1,200 students in her classes this semester. That's maxed out, and it has been for some time. Uh, it's a class that others in her field of study are talking about all around the nation. Uh, the classes are even offered a, a condensed version online uh, for free. And uh, the premise of the class is how can a person find happiness? And she said it's taken over the campus. Everybody wants to be in these classes. And when asked why does she believe that uh, the class has been so popular, she said, well, I wish it were me, but really the popularity of the class is based on what she believes. There's never been a time where students are more stressed, more depressed, more anxious than ever before in life. In fact, a recent study by the American College Health Association supports that opinion that she has, where there are uh, 50, 52 percent of the students who are there uh, would uh, they, they consider are uh, experiencing uh, emotional stress, that they're depressed. In fact, 32 percent of that, 39 percent of that 52 percent would be considered clinically depressed. They're not able at times to even function while they're at the university. So there's a heightened awareness about this, the mental health issue, and I think it's true not only of students, but it's true of everybody in life, that there's this tendency to be anxious, to worry. Uh, in, in, uh, in her study, she does a comparative with a colleague of hers, a friend of hers at the University of California in Riverside. And when asked, what is it that produces happiness in a person's life, her study found that 50% uh, is based on genetics. Either you have a predisposition toward that or you don't. For 10% uh, of a person's happiness is based on circumstances. And then 40% is based on your thoughts, your attitudes, the will, the choice to be happy. Now, in the first class, she has a survey. What is it that you believe will make you happy? And she said, without a doubt, almost every person will put something based on circumstance. If I have more money, if I have a, a different relationship, if I have a better job, these are the things that are going to make me happy. And through the class, the students discover that those are the things that do not make a person happy whatsoever. It's interesting that only 10% of our happiness is based on circumstances, but I dare say that 90% of our time and energy is consumed with those things in life that we want to change that we believe will make us happier. Now, today, everybody in this room, it's not just college students, but everybody in this room tends to worry. Uh, I won't have a show of hands, but, you know, we worry about yesterday. And we worry about the things that we didn't get done, or we worry about things that we should have done, or we didn't know we were supposed to do, and now we found out about it, and we're stressed out about how we're going to fix that problem that was for yesterday. Or we're worried about tomorrow. We're worried, am I going to have enough money for retirement? I'm worried about my health. We're worried about today. We're worried about our family. We're worried about our jobs. We're worried about lunch. We're worried about whatever it is that we tend to worry about. And it's, it's, it's totally consuming our lives. Well, God in His sovereignty and in His wisdom understood that we would all have a tendency to worry. And that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus addresses this issue of worry in the sixth chapter of Matthew. Now, if you will, open your Bibles to that, uh, that chapter, and we're going to talk about it for just a few moments. Uh, as, as way of introduction, in the first few verses of chapter 6, Jesus, remember, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is talking about a comparison between actions on the outside and what we're thinking and believing on the inside. 
the integrity of our heart, the purity of our heart. Jesus is uh, speaking to a crowd. They're aware of the religious leaders of that day who are stressing them out over rules and regulations, the do's and don'ts of religion. Jesus says you bind heavy burdens on these people. Uh, they, they, they're consumed. Am I good enough? Have I done enough for God to accept me? They're worn out. They're beat up by, by it's, it's spiritual abuse that has taken place. And so Jesus shifts the emphasis to focusing on that which is inside of us. And so he's talking about, in chapter 6, the right way to pray, the right way to give, the right way to fast. And so he talks about a person with pure motives uh, that they, against those who have impure motives. Those who have impure motives do those things, giving, praying, and fasting, to impress others or to impress God by the illustrations that he gives. They do it to manipulate God. God, I've done this for you, now reward me. Uh, make me happy. Give me what I think will make me happy because I've done these things to make you happy. You owe me. Uh, and we may not say that out loud or even think it that out loud, but we, we, we tend to believe that. That, that we want God to perform for us based on what we've done. Uh, these people do these things in order to get acceptance by God. God will like me. God will accept me if I do all these things that are required of me. Uh, it, it, they do this in order to secure their salvation. That uh, it, you know, salvation is based on performance. It's based on the good things that we do in life. Good things are important, but they are evidence of our faith. They don't produce our faith. Jesus says that those who operate this way, their reward is given by men. They'll see what you do. They acknowledge what you do, but God will not. Those with pure motives in giving, praying, and fasting do so because they love God. Why do I pray? Why do I give? Why do I fast? Because I simply love God. They are convicted and they are humbled by their sin. They, they don't have pride. They're willing to let their ego go. They recognize who they are before a holy God. In fact, they want to serve God. They don't want to serve themselves. They don't care about themselves. They want to serve God. They want to serve His purpose in His kingdom. Jesus says that their reward will be given by God. Now, Jesus talks about the problem of worry in this context. So notice in Matthew chapter 6, I want to begin in verse 25. Notice the first line. He says, this is why I tell you. Now, that obviously refers to something previously he has just said. In the previous verse, he says about possessions. He's talking about giving and about our possessions. That you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and you cannot serve money. If you are a citizen in the kingdom of God, then God is your master. God is your heavenly father. And in light of that, he says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add a single cubit to his height by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Learn how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry about saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the idolaters eagerly seek all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. <clears throat> but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own we all said to that, amen, right? I mean, we all know about the worry that is consuming our time just about today. So there are several things that I want to share with you 
uh, that uh, God is revealing in his word about how to try and f- try to, how to find true happiness. Uh, I mean, students are eagerly seeking that. We're all seeking that, how to experience meaning in life. But we're being robbed of that because of worry. Well, first of all, worry distracts us from God's purpose. Notice verse 25. Don't worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, the word worry there means to have a divided mind. I'm distracted. I'm going in two different directions. Now, our food, our clothing, uh, drink, it's our basic needs. And he's not saying that these are not important, but we don't need to be consumed by thinking about those needs and trusting him that he will meet them. He tells us not to worry about them for a very good reason. Notice he says, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? You circle the word more. There's more to life than these things that we worry about. God has a greater purpose. Life is a gift from God. It's something that he willed for your life. You're here because he determined you to be here. That means your life has purpose now what is the purpose of God if worry distracts us from God's purpose what is God's purpose C.S. Lewis wrote in mere Christianity God's purpose for three specific things God's purpose for the state he says it exists to promote and to protect our happiness God created the state the government for our happiness now what does that mean it means that a couple will decide that they're going to go out to eat They're going to get in their car. They're going to leave their home. They're going to lock their home. They're going to drive safely to a restaurant. And they're going to go in and hopefully have a a nice, peaceful meal without any distractions or whatever else. The state is there to make that happen. To know that when I come home, that my house is protected, that while I drive, the streets are protected, that while I'm there at the restaurant, I'm protected there. So God has designed the state. It has a purpose. Although sometimes we wonder, we don't understand it or or all the rest, but God has created. Romans 13 affirms that. God also has a purpose, as C.S. Lewis writes, for the church. And here's what he says about that. In the same way, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ to make them little Christ. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, Even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. So God's purpose for the church is to lead people to saving faith in Jesus Christ and to help them become little Christ. That's called discipleship. That's called growing in our faith and and, and equipping them to experience the fullness of life. So what we're about here is to helping people become little Christ. Not, the, of course, be a Christ, but to emulate his life and to be like Jesus Christ. Now, God is not merely, uh, excuse me just a minute. Uh, God also has a purpose for man. And that is, as C.S. Lewis says, is to know God. And what he means by that in the context of what he wrote is the transforming power of God. How to be transformed, how to be changed. If we're going to be little Christ, how does that happen? And so that's the goal for you is to become more like Christ. The goal of the church is to facilitate that. But what are you to become? More like Jesus Christ. To glorify him with my life and to make him known. Richard Foster about that point says the contrast between God's way of doing things and our way is never more acute in this area of human change and transformation. We focus on specific actions. God focuses on us. We work from the outside in. God works from the inside out. We try. God transforms. Now that's exactly the point that Jesus is making in the Sermon on the Mount. That it's all about the inward transformation of your heart. That is God's purpose. And listen, worry will distract you from experiencing God's purpose. I'm worrying about these things. I'm not allowing God to change me. Okay, I have a bad circumstance. I have something to worry about. But what am I going to do about that? 
And how am I going to allow Christ to change the way I think about that and the way I respond to that? Because listen, as the study shows in the Yale class, which I don't have time to get into, the 40% of your happiness is based on the choice you make to be happy. You're going to choose to be unhappy and, and there are some people who wake up every morning, they choose to be unhappy, and that's what fuels their existence. They don't know how to exist if they were to be happy because that's just how they're wired. They're, de they're designed so that I choose to be unhappy. Where you have a choice, yeah, it's bad, but I'm going to choose to respond in a way, listen, that not just makes me happy, but as a Christian, that glorifies God. As our witness to him, as someone said, our outward appearance is only an inward frame around inward qualities. What we're doing on the outside is a reflection of who we are and representing Jesus Christ. Worry also devalues our self-worth. You ever feel down about yourself? Uh, you don't like yourself. You wish you could change yourself. You worry about the way you look or about this or that. Well, worry devalues our self-worth. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? He says, look at the obvious. God is the creator of the universe. And what he has created, he sustains it. He takes care of it. And notice the change. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. They're not concerned about it, birds of the sky, but He takes care of them. If He cares for the birds of the sky, is He going to neglect you? No. Jesus makes it very clear. He cares about you. You're asking the question, what about me? Well, God is not only your creator, but He is your Father. And as a loving father, though you may not have had that here on earth, as a heavenly father, he fulfills that role in providing everything that you need. It means that I'm important to him. You're important to him. You know, see, worry, listen, worry is the admission that you're not important to God. Well, pastor, I don't mean to say that, but that's what you are saying. When you worry, you're saying, I'm not important to God. He doesn't care about me. If he did, he would help me. Now, the problem is we have a certain way we believe God is supposed to help us. But God, indeed, will help us. That's how the enemy, listen, robs us of our joy. He's trying to distort your view of God exactly what he did in the Garden of Eden. He distorted the view of God to Adam and Eve. And that's how he wants to rob you of your joy is say, God's not who he says he is. God's not going to act like you want him to act. God doesn't care about you. If he cared about you, he would do these things. It's a lie straight from hell because that's not who God is. Now, what does the Bible say about this? The Bible says in Genesis 1 from the very get-go that you're created in the image of God. That means you have value, that he loves you, that you're his child. So much so that he died on the cross for your sin. You need to realize today who you are in the sight of God. You're more important than anything else he has created. We admire all the things he's created. You're far more important than that. And listen, if he takes care of them, he will take care of you. So you have no reason to worry. Notice third, worry doesn't change anything you heard your mom or your dad say that your teacher said that whoever else well they're right but Jesus is the one who authored that statement verse 27 can any of you add a single cubit to his height by worrying now height it can be translated in two different ways or this word that is used it can refer to a measurement a cubit uh, which in that day and time would be from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger that would be a cubit, and they would measure in that way. You know, when they measure a horse, how tall a horse is, they measure it by what? Hands, all right? Well, that day and time, that's how they would measure, about 18 inches. Now, who can add 
when you're mature, who, who can do anything to add even an inch to your life. You can't do anything about that. You can't change that. The other way this is translated is that you can add time to your life. It's concerning the duration of life. And God is in total control of your life. Now, I think we ought to do all that we can to, to uh, help extend life. And that's why we have medicine and all the rest to help us and to preserve life. And, 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 and God has given that to us. But God controls the number of days that we're here. And there is nothing that we can do to change that. Our lives are in His hands. He starts it and He ends it. I am to do all I can do. I'm to do what God has told me to do, and then I just leave the rest into his hands. Notice worry also prevents trust in God. Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? Learn how the wild flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Botanists tell us that there are over 100,000 types of flowers, over 5,000 types of grasses. Uh, and, and I, I'd like for him to tell me how many weeds there are because I got half of them in my yard. But, but, but think of that. All the 100,000 flowers, the way that God has provided beauty. God not only closed the fields, but he does it in a wonderful way, a beautiful way. Verse 29, Jesus says, Solomon could not match God's display of beauty by what he wore compared to what, how God clothes the, the planet verse 30 if that's how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow won't he do much more for you no one may notice that one flower but God notices you no one may see the beauty in your life but God sees that you are beautiful to him and he sees it. And we need to allow him to let that beauty come out of us. That's what the focus is all about. Flowers are temporary, but you're eternal. And we're not only significant here, but we're significant to God for all of eternity. That's why he's provided a place for us when we die. And all the good that comes with that, but to know that I'll be able to worship him that is true we can trust God and he can take care of us but see worry what does it do it exposes our lack of trust our lack of faith verse 30 you of little faith now little faith is saving faith but that's about all there are a lot of people they they they've been saved but that's about it those who have little faith are more prone to worry and have anxiety Worry is always ultimately due to a lack of faith. Little faith is a person who does not brace all the promises of God. Little faith is believing in God, but not believing God. Here's where uh, uh, a lot of people live. I read this by Paul Tripp this week. He says that we, we, we look back and we say, God has forgiven me of my sin at the point of salvation. I had faith in him to do that. I have faith in him that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But why is it between then and our future, we lack faith in the nowism of today? We struggle living by faith. We have faith in salvation. We have faith that he's got a home in heaven for me. We all want that. But we worry. Worry, worry. And we're not trusting him. We show constantly a lack of faith in him. Little faith is a person who is being controlled by something or someone else rather than controlling your own thoughts. That's why James says, consider, think. Do you ever find yourself waking up at night and you begin to worry? You're thinking about all those things. Your head's going in circles. Listen, that's not thinking. That is a lack of thinking. Thinking is continuing that thought. What am I going to do with this? Am I going to continue to just sit here in circles and worry, have a sleepless night? Or am I going 
to trust him. I'm going to exercise faith in him. Now, look, all of us have times where this happens. I mean, it happens to me. I can go to, I told you a few weeks ago, I have no problem going to sleep. But I can wake up in the middle of the night and, 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 and I will tend to start thinking about just things I have to get done. I don't know if I'm worrying or not, but then that can lead to worry, and I will worry. And at that time, I've got to decide what am I going to do with this. And sometimes I, I uh, you know, get back there, and sometimes I don't. It's a struggle. And so uh, I, I may fall back to sleep, but then I wake up thinking about it again. And so uh, it's exposing my lack of faith in knowing that God's in control of this. I can rest in that uh, rather than getting worked up about all those things that we tend to worry about. Little faith is the failure to take Scripture at face value. Either we believe it or we don't. Either we believe what God has said or we don't believe what He has said. Little faith is the failure to recognize the implications of our salvation. That means my position in Christ, who I am in Christ. I'm His child. Paul said it like this in Romans 8. He did not even spare His own Son but offered him up for us all, how will he not also with him grant us everything? So worry exposes our lack of trust, the little faith that we have. We need to apply the faith that we have and let that faith grow. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus and his disciples, they're on the sea, the storm comes, and Jesus asks his disciples after their worry, where is your faith? Well, if God has given you faith to believe in Him, in salvation, and to believe you have a home in heaven, then we need to believe Him now, to trust Him with what you're worrying about at this moment. But the real heart of what Jesus says is next. Worry is idolatry. Verse 31. So don't worry saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For idolaters eagerly seek all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Now, when he uses the word idolaters, it could be translated Gentiles, the heathens, the pagans, those who are not followers of God. Now, those who are not followers of God, they may have, even those who claim to know God, may have a contingent or an accidental faith. That's how they view the world. That means there's no rhyme or reason to the world. There's no purpose uh, to that so that's the kind of faith that they have it's just it's an accidental faith we're just here and it doesn't mean anything on the other extreme is a fatalistic faith that means you do the best you can you can't control anything uh, and, and it's a fatalistic view it's a predetermined aspect of life I'm, I, I, I'm totally out of control there is no 40 percent for me I, I can't choose what matter what difference does it make if I choose to be happy we have a certain faith. That is a Christian worldview. My faith is certain of who God is and my responsibility to place my faith in Him. Non-believers, Jesus says, pursue the things of the world. They find pleasure and satisfaction in that which is created when God says what's been created is good, but it's not for your consumption. It is for moving you toward me. Because what we tend to do, and we begin to focus on what's created. That's going to make me happy. If I have these things, I'll be happy. These things are only to point us to Him. These things are not bad. They're good. They, they add value to our life and meaning to our life. But when they begin to consume our lives, and we begin to worry about those things, that's where we become idolaters. What does it do? Worry exposes my idol. What is it that I truly worship? Now, we, we don't like hearing that, and we, I don't like saying it. And I, I didn't like reading it. But that's what Jesus said. If we worry, we're, we're, there's an idol that's, that's being exposed. So what do we do? We acknowledge it. Just come clean and say, yes, I've had to do that. We all have to do that if we're going to experience uh, true happiness true fulfillment, true joy in our life. God knows what you need better than you know what you need. That's why you need to know Him. 
because he'll give you what you need. That's why we seek him in verse 33. But seek first. They seek these things. Here's what I want you to seek. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things that you think you need, I'll give you. I'll give what, exactly what you need. What is Jesus saying? Seek me. That's who you need to seek. Because I'm the only one who can satisfy the deep longing in your heart to be loved and fulfilled. So, if you're, worrying, if you're going to worry about anything, Jesus is saying, worry about your relationship to him. Is he first? Seek first. That's what we're to worry about. Then notice finally, worry steals our time and our energy. Verse 34. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Most of us are crucified between two thieves, the cross of yesterday and the cross of tomorrow. It's hard for us to live now. And worry is a powerful force. And what happens is we worry so much about yesterday or tomorrow that we cannot do what we're supposed to do right now. We're not able to deal with the problem that is facing us. And here's what Jesus is saying. God has allowed the circumstances into your life today that you need to be concerned about. You need to deal with this. This is, this is the issue, and so deal with this. But here's what happens to us. We're so worked up about yesterday or tomorrow, it's robbed us of energy, mental energy energy, physical energy, emotional energy, spiritual energy, where we're paralyzed. Have you found yourself doing this, either at home or at work? You sat there, and, and you did nothing most of the day. You worried, and you worried, and you worried, and you didn't get done what was supposed to be done. You didn't, you didn't get your work done. That you, you had deadlines or things you wanted to get done. And you didn't get that done because you're distracted. And then at the end of the day you say, man, I am so tired. But all you did was sit there. You didn't do anything. You didn't go run. You didn't go exercise. You didn't do those things. Why? Because the, the energy that is required to worry has taken away your ability to handle what God has given you today. That's what Jesus is saying. And so we have to make that choice. If I, if I have these resources that God has given me, tomorrow's going to take care of itself. I can't do anything about yesterday. I need to maximize today. I need to take advantage of today. I need to solve this problem today. And God, I'm thankful that you've given me everything that I need, the energy, the wisdom, all that I need to take care of this problem right now. Well, how do we overcome worry? You know, I find in relationships, in talking with people, that when there's worry in the relationship, it's usually a result of one of two things or both. There's a lack of communication or there is a lack of trust. That when, when a couple of friends are not talking with each other, the imagination starts to take off. There's no clear communication, so we begin to assume things. And then we begin to worry that that is true about the relationship. When most of the time, it's not true. And so there's no communication. Or, or, and often that will lead to a lack of trust in that person. I, I don't know, therefore, I don't trust. Well, worry spiritually often happens because there's a lack of communication with God and a lack of trust in God. Paul would say it like this in Philippians chapter 4 about talking to God. This is why it's so important. If you want to overcome worry, verse 6, don't worry about anything, but in everything... Through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Talk to Him. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? Paul just affirms what Jesus is saying. That we seek Him. We talk to Him. You might need to get somebody near you to help you do that. Uh, that that be, is a catalyst to help you begin a conversation with God. And then we're to trust Him. What, what does it say in Proverbs? Trust Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, everything you've got going on, in all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. He will lead and you can follow Him. You can trust God. So today, there might be somebody who needs to begin a conversation with God. You, you need to come to Him with your worries, with your life. It's in Christ alone. We sang it just a minute ago, a beautiful song, that if we're really going to experience true happiness, it's found in Christ and Him alone. And today I want to offer you the opportunity to follow Him, to trust Him, to begin a journey of faith where you're talking with God, He's talking with you, you're in this relationship, and that you can trust Him. And that means that we turn from our sin and we turn to Christ and Him alone. Knowing that it's not what I do, it's not who I am, it's who He is. And so I'm going to change directions. I'm, I'm tired of worrying. And God give me the faith now to believe. Now if I worry, does it mean I'm not a Christian? No, it doesn't mean that necessarily. I've told you I do that, we all do that. So for those of us who are Christians, what does that mean that we do? Well. We need to be honest with ourselves about the idols that we tend to worship. So whatever you're worried about, that might be a clue that that's the idol that God is exposing for you just to say, yes, God, that is an idol in my life. And I'm worrying about this way too much. And so I give that to you. I, I'm going to worship you and you alone, and I'm going to let you handle this. Now give me the wisdom to know how to deal with this. But listen, remember, God loves you. He knows where you are. He, he knows the problems you're facing. He's allowed them. And the problems are not to cause us to worry and drive us away from God. They're to drive us to Him. To experience Him in that moment of worry. There might be others God is leading to become part of our church family. Hey, let's join all the rest of the warriors that are here, Okay. And uh, we, can, we can help each other because we need that. And uh, we'd love for you to experience the Lord in this place uh, on a regular basis. There might be others of you who need to come and pray. Maybe you need somebody to pray for you, something that is a worry, a concern, a burden on your heart. Uh, and the Bible says that we're to pray for one another. So why don't you allow somebody to pray for you this morning? Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts today, for reminding me once again of how significant this issue is, the problem of worry, and what it's really saying about where we are spiritually in our walk with you. Lord, help us to, as you speak to us and reveal these things to us, to uh, admit that and then take the step of faith we need to take. And so, God, that's what I simply pray, that right now you'll help these who need to take that step of faith and obedience for your glory but also for their good to experience the good life that can be found in Christ alone. In Jesus' name, amen.